Hi, welcome to the first presentation of our uh, usually semi-annual book buzz program that we do at the North Carroll Branch Library. This time we're going live to everybody for our virtual bu book buzz program. We like to call the one in the fall our hot titles for cool weather. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. And if you were in person, I would always stand up and say how lucky we are to have uh, our friends with Penguin Random House so very close to us right here in Carroll County. And they are always generous to all our needs. And also, I love it when they come out and supply us with a great, um, it's almost like arming us with ammunition for our books. We need a pile, our pile of to be read to get higher and higher. And they really help us with that. Tonight, we are joined by Judy Samuels and Amanda McGuire. I am going to let both of you introduce yourselves if you would like. Miss Judy, would you like to start? Sure. I'm Judy Samuels. I'm a sales rep with Penguin Young Readers, which means I get to sell children's books for kids zero to about 18 to independent bookstores all across the country. Excellent. Miss Amanda, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Amanda McGuire. I am also a Penguin sales rep, but I sell to the adult books uh, for all of our adult divisions. And most of my stores are on the East Coast and in the South. Excellent. I always like to say our adult readers are just our big kid readers anyway. We all have a kid Absolutely. in us somewhere. So uh, we all have to um, make sure we get our, our, our fill of everything we need, just like the kids need. <laughs> Well, tonight we're going to take a look at some great titles that are coming out in the near future or some that may already be out and have kind of maybe have snuck underneath your radar that our friends from Penguin Random House are going to let you know about. And so hopefully you have pen and paper ready or you can go back and watch the recording again so that you can get some great titles that will help you warm up when you need something to read this fall and winter. Alrighty, I'm going to start our slideshow. Is everybody ready? Ready. Ready. Okay, we're going to start with some fantastic children's books, um, really with picture books for our youngest readers. So we usually say that really anyone can be for picture books. I happen to really enjoy this one myself, and I'm definitely not four to six years old. <laughs> <laughs> it tends to be the market for your preschoolers and your younger elementary school um, students. I will say that most of you might know Dan Brown, not from the picture book realm, but from his thrillers. So if you like the Da Vinci Code books, I myself am a big Robert Langdon fan. Um, <laughs> that's really where he got his name from. Uh, but he wrote this book, Wild Symphony, really because his parents were musicians and teachers, and he has a love of music. And so it is a fun romp um, <coughs> where different animals are learning to play different instruments so that they can work together to compose a symphony. And one of the cool things about this book is that if you purchase it, you can download an app. And with the app, you can listen to music composed for the book. And they are adding new compositions all the time. So it really makes it interactive. So it's a fun read aloud, but it's also really fun to listen to. Um, you can even go to the website. I think it's wildsymphony.com and you can listen to some of the music there. It's all pieces that were specifically composed for this book. So it makes it a really unique feature. And all of the music was written by Dan Brown himself. And then if you're feeling like altruistic, um, all of the US uh, royalties for this book is being donated to music education. So it's okay. a kind of nice one for that, for animal lovers and for music lovers. That's okay, awesome. Daryl. Yeah, yeah, we can the, go, I, it, it's good. <laughs> I got a quick question for us big kids. Does he throw any kind of references to like any of his adult works in there, kind of hidden angels and Not demons? Not that or I can see, no, it releases? is very okay. specific for little ones. I don't think anyone's gonna be looking for like Robert Langdon clues through the pages. I'm sure that you could like manifest something, okay. um, but it's really just animals figuring out instruments and what they like to play. And it does have some really like hilarious tuck-ins to the illustration. So you'll see things beyond just the text that you'll be able to laugh about and to point out as you read it aloud. Awesome, thank you. Okay, all right, next book. Okay, so 
You might not know Misty Copeland, but she's rather famous. She was the first black prima ballerina um, for the American Ballet in New York. Um, this is her second picture book with us. Her first one is called Firebird and is about the ballet of the same name. And it's absolutely stunning. Bunheads is the first in a picture book series that's starting. And this series is pretty interesting because it follows a little troupe of ballerinas but it also talks about the ballet they will be performing. So every book is a new ballet, but it's also new behind the scenes. Um, it's really beautifully illustrated. It has a very diverse ballet troupe, which they liked, especially the fact that there you know, are children of diverse backgrounds. There's boys, there's girls. It really talks about the love of dance. And it also has an interesting aspect of, again, like behind the scenes and the performance of the ballet and how they have to rehearse and they have to work. Um, the nice thing is, is there are signed copies available through many independent bookstores. So it makes it a really nice holiday gift. And Misty has been talking about this book all over the place, like Good Morning America and the Today Show and things like that. So you may have heard about it. It just came out a couple weeks ago and it's just a beautiful picture book. Okay, I guess we can go next. Following up another picture book. Okay, so Oliver Jeffers has written some pretty quirky things. Um, people might know him best for being the illustrator for The Day the Crayons Quit and The Day the Crayons Came Home, because that's kind of like a household staple. But he's also written some wonderful things. My boys particularly love The Book Eating Boy, <laughs> um, which <laughs> is a really fun one. But recently he's written some really beautiful picture books that were inspired by his children. So a few years ago we had um, Here We Are, which he wrote for his son, which was all about um, an introduction to the earth to your baby and all your hopes and dreams. And then when his daughter was born, he said, oh, I'm going to have to make her a book too. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we'll build is his ode to his daughter. It is everything he hopes that she accomplishes, her dreams, um, the importance of kindness and thinking of others, of taking care of yourself, of art and music. It's really lovely. It's one of those books that like if you are struck by, I call it the parent feels, you know, when you see something that just triggers that little like bubble of tears when you read something for your kids, um, warning that could be this book. Because when I read What We'll Build or Here We Are, my boys are like, mommy, maybe daddy should read it so you don't cry. <laughs> but it's really beautiful. It just came out on sale. And if you go to Oliver's Instagram or social media pages, you can see some really great behind the scenes of how he created the book. Okay. We can go to the next one. All right, now we're getting more into chapter book ages. So I think Narwhal and Jelly is great for kids that are like four to six. Um, they're usually little stories. It's almost, it's graphic novel-esque, like a very early graphic novel featuring a little Narwhal and his best friend, Jelly the Jellyfish. This is a series of holiday stories. So it's great for Christmas. Um, there's all kinds of like jokes and fun and misunderstandings, which is a big thing with Narwhal and Jelly books is the misunderstanding of um, common like earth things. Um, but this one is a very sweet one. It's available now and it's perfect for your little fans. Okay, Daryl, we can go next. Okay. Now, I don't know. It might be just a me thing. I think like all book lovers have a, a special place in their heart for Matilda. Mm -hmm. You're um, right. <laughs> right. Um, this edition is very special. So while we probably all have an edition of Matilda on the shelf, we might not have this one. It is fully illustrated. It is a big book. It's a bigger trim size. It comes with a ribbon bookmark, right? So it's just like the ribbon on Matilda's hair. Um, and it's fully <laughs> illustrated. So if you've seen the illustrated editions of like the Percy Jackson books or the Harry Potter illustrated editions, that's what you can expect with this one. It's really lovely. They've broken down the text so that it's easy to read aloud. I find that Raw Dahl is one of those authors that is so fun to read aloud no matter the age of your child. He's also one of those authors where you're reading it aloud and you can read it aloud and your four-year-old will love it, but your 20-year-old will be like, oh my gosh, I remember this book, you know? So it's one of those books that just feels ageless. And it's one that I definitely ordered for myself because I had to have this edition because it's so lovely, um, but it just makes a really great gift a book and it's nice and sturdy. So when you hand it over beautifully wrapped, someone's going to be like, oh, this is substantial. Super good. All right, next. Okay, if you have kids that love graphic novels, and if they are in that early elementary school age, well, even up until middle school, Melly Bean could be a great one for them. It's about a dog with a lot of heart, 
not necessarily the sharpest tack in the box, um, <laughs> but Melly Bean has a lot of courage. Melly Bean lives with two cats that like to play a trick, like like to play tricks on them. Um, and Melly Bean is stuck digging a hole, and instead of you know just being stuck in the hole, winds up falling into a magical dimension where magic is being stolen, and she's got to help save a bunny corn like bunny corns they're a thing it's awesome there's a giant magical bunny corn that needs rescuing um it's uh, nice because it's one of those books it's really sweet um the danger is not incredible stakes so if you have kids that are a little anxious you know and maybe they don't like the books where like there is lots of peril they'd probably really like this one because it's sweet um it's nicely paced the illustrations are very vibrant and it has not a happy ending, which I think all little ones love. So this is definitely my recommendation. My boys are, uh, they were seven when they first read this um, and now they're eight and they still loved it. And we have another book coming out in a year where Melly Bean is gonna have to go back to the magical land and it brings those troublesome cats with them. Um, and they're gonna go on for further adventures. And my boys were immediately asking like if some of the little um, loose threads in Melly Bean and the giant monster were gonna be tied up in the second one. So. I think it definitely gets that kid approval. All right, next. Now, I know that everyone who attends this book class <laughs> in the past when we're in person loves Chris Kravenstein. Like, we know it, okay? Crowd goes wild, whether it's for Lemoncello or if it's for his Motel series. Like, he is just a fantastic middle grade writer. Pitch perfect for ages, like, 8 to 12. And now he's got a new adventure, the smartest kid um, in the universe. It is comic. There are bad guys, good guys, friendships. There's pirates. Um, I think that this is going to be a crowd pleaser, even if they've never read any of the other books, because the pacing and the wit is just so funny. You think Chris Gravenstein is like a 10-year-old kid when you read his writing, and it is just like spot on with how kids talk and think and feel and what they think is funny, so really recommend this one and it's coming out in December that's the one I've already ordered a couple of for Christmas gifts yeah like oh, it's I funny that's the one like when we're out and about you know and you're at the store and you might see someone who has been to one of your book buzz presentations or they're like Miss Judy I saw you at book fair at the community college you know when is there going to be a new Chris Robinson book and I was like oh it's coming you know so um <laughs> Stephanie who usually does she'll do the random house children's presentation for this was just like you're going to make so many people happy talking about this book and, you know it deserves it because they're just fantastic the boys and I are rereading Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's library right now just because again they're a book that's like a fantastic read aloud even though you wouldn't think about it because it's a middle grade chapter book all right no questions about this one all right we can go my to the next did, my daughter's school did Lemoncello the other year as the one school one book project Such a good choice they loved it I was so happy to introduce my youngest daughter and other audiences uh, to Mr. Chris's work. They love them all. It's so good. It's And then <laughs> the boys got very excited because I think Netflix has the film up. It, yes. Um, yeah, it was <laughs> on Nickelodeon once upon a time and there's mm -hmm. a film adaptation of Mr. Lemoncello's library. And they um, they were just like, mom. And I was like, well, I know what we'll be watching like 52 times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one, Daryl. Now, this is a little different. It's a beautiful gift edition, but Ruby Bridges, who is really known as being, um, you know, one of the first children that was uh, integrated into schools during the civil rights era, um, was inspired by the wave of recent events to write a book about her experience as a civil rights icon and her hopes and dreams for the future and kind of how kids can take a stand and take an action to make the world a better place. It's done in a beautiful gift edition. Um, the cover is actually taken from the Norman Rockwell painting that he did of Ruby walking into the school. Um, so I think that this is just a book that is um, needed. It is a lovely package. It is inspirational and it can definitely be beneficial for little readers or people who just really love memoirs. Okay, Daryl, next one. 
Now we're moving into our activity books, which really can be for any age, but they're typically for elementary school and early middle school. The highlight book of things to do is a brick of a book. It is over 300 activities that you can do at home with things that you already have. Now we've seen a lot of these books lately, like Maker Labs, right? Science books, cooking books, all of these kind of things. But the highlights book of things to do is anything. How to make a musical instrument, how to make, um, you know, snow at, ha at the home and make your own snowballs, how to make appetizers and desserts, um, art projects, how to make faux stained glass, how to make rock candy. So if you have kids that like to be busy, or if you're a parent who's just like, we need to get them off of screen time, this is a fantastic activity book. And I really like the fact that it has something for everyone because not everyone's really into cooking and not everyone's like a science kid and not everyone, you know, it, so it does have a nice variety of projects. And it's from Highlights who, you know, are the Highlights magazine. We trust them with activities and things for kids to do. They put so much thought. It's beautiful. It's full color. Um, easy for you to like put little post-its. My boys have little post-its in theirs for all the things that they've done. And then a different color post-it for all the things that they want to do. So it's a really fun activity. And for 300 different activities, um, I think $24.99 is a great price. <laughs> All right, we can go to the next one, Daryl. And then if you do have ones who like to cook, and I have one of these two, and every day I'm so grateful he doesn't burn down the house, um, <laughs> right? It's like you want them to figure out how to do things, but you're also like, please not. Um, the Kitchen Explorers is great. It's from America's Test Kitchen, which people know and love. <laughs> Um, it's great for kids that are 8 to 12 who want to try recipes and science experiments, hands-on activities, um, lots of great things, over 60 different opportunities and a $12.99 price point. So really great for the youngest chefs. And they have a nice variety of difficulty there. So they have for kids that are just starting out and then they do have some recipes that are a little more, um, there's more to it and more steps so that kids can kind of grow those skill sets. So I think that this one is a great one too, especially for kids that have that little culinary event who have maybe watched that junior master chef on Netflix over and over again. Okay, next one, Daryl. All right, Jacqueline Woodson. This is not the first Jacqueline Woodson I've ever presented on Book Buzz and it definitely will not be the last because her writing is so beautiful. When I am in a reading slump, I go to Jackie Woodson. It, her books are just, oh, they're so wonderful. She has written for children, um, for picture books and middle grade, and she has written for adults now. And she just is able to break down the human condition in such a beautiful way. Um, this is an interesting story because it's about a little boy whose father was a professional football player. And his father is now suffering from concussion syndrome and how that's changing. And so it's a look at kind of like um, sports, but also the danger it does to your body, but also that family dynamic of not having the father that you remember and trying to adapt to life as you know it. Um, now, I will say one of the things I love so much about this book is it has such strong male friendships. So if you're looking for a nice book about boys that has healthy male friendships and supportive community, this is a really beautiful one. It's already racked up a couple starred reviews. Um, I think that it's just, it's so beautifully done. It would be a great book club book. It would be a great like parent child read which is really lovely. Um, I would say this book uh, would really be for ages eight to 12, would be the perfect, it's middle grade. So if you have eight-year-olds that are, you know, very strong readers, I think you'll get that. The nice thing about Jackie's books um, are that um, there's beauty in her brevity, I like to say. She's not a long writer. Um, she doesn't waste words. So you, if you have kids that have been frustrated in reading before because they feel like there's a lot of filler you don't have to worry about that with um anything written by Jacqueline Woodson just because it is every word is purposeful um and she really writes on a level that is uh, it's addictive to all readers so highly recommend her and especially this one football family good friends it's beautiful all right next and then if you've attended any of our book buzz, you know that I happen to like things that are creepy. <laughs> 
So this is an interesting thing. We like to call it Neil Gaiman's Coraline Meets Stranger Things, but the premise is that there is a town that has been supernaturally sustained for years, hundreds of years, meaning that there's never, there's no unemployment and there's no crime and everything is picturesque and perfect. And it's kept that way because the town founders made a deal with a shadowy underworld figure called Mr. January. And every 13 years he comes and takes three 13 year olds as his price. But this year's 13 year olds aren't having it and they're fighting back. So think about the mad dash through a moonlight town you see in Hocus Pocus, sidestepping shadowy figures and trying to unlock puzzles to keep your wits and to keep your life. And that is 13s. It's great for kids who love goosebumps. Awesome for kids who maybe read Small Spaces by Catherine Arden or kids who maybe uh, like things that creep them out a little bit, but this is fantastic. And there will be a follow-up to this um, next fall. Will it be called 14s? No, it's called, um, oh, I can't announce it yet, but okay. it is not. But it is named <laughs> after a supernatural creature that will feature prominently. Ooh, so okay. it's really good. The author, Kate Alice Marshall, has also written some great young adult novels. So she's got a surviving wilderness, almost like a, a young adult hatchet called I Am Still Alive. And she has this creepy YA. Okay, so if you like like video games like Silent Hill or you were a big fan of the Blair Witch Project or things like that, Rules for Vanishing, Daryl made my husband come to bed early that night so that I wasn't asleep by myself so the ghost couldn't get me. <laughs> this is scary. so right up your alley, Judy. <laughs> it was so, like, her writing is just so fantastic. I will say she definitely dials down the scares from her YA to the middle grade, um, but it is still, it is definitely will send a chill up your spine, so I wouldn't pass this one up. It's, it's good fun, especially for this time of year because it's available now. Get this, read it on Halloween night, have a good time with it. I just right. wrote it down. Yeah, it's so good. Uh, it's nice. They're, and they're smart kids using their brains to solve the problems, which is always, you know, a nice moral. Okay. I really don't have a lot to say about this series because I think everybody knows how amazing it is. Um, if you don't know, Last Kids on Earth is now six books in a highly illustrated middle grade series about the last kids standing in a monster apocalypse. They live in a tree house, they fight monsters, and they're desperately trying to uncover how to undo it all and right the world. In book six, we see Jack and the gang actually leaving their town for the first time. They're going on a road trip to try to see if they can um, finally uncover the source of all the madness and try to right the wrongs. These are fun, fast paced, and they are the basis of the Netflix um, series, which season three comes out on October 16th. Did you write that one down, Daryl? I am. We're very excited about that. <laughs> um, that each, each of the seasons is based on one of the books. So season two is book two, and um, season three is book three, but this is book six. I know this is one that kids are always asking me when they're coming out. Um, so we usually have one now every fall. I will say we're super excited because there's going to be um, a special kind of satellite book to the last kids on earth coming out in the spring so watch your calendars for that because it's going to be really exciting but these are really fun I like to say it's like the walking dead for tweens and video gamers <laughs> but the monsters aren't all bad either which is pretty nice so you know they have a monstrous dog they wind up making friends with this like monster warrior who helps them so I, I definitely think this is a crowd favorite and again, this is for like ages eight to 12. So solid middle grade. Now with the next book, we'll be moving into YA. And so when we say YA and young adult, we typically mean 12 and up. Um, some books for content are described as 14 and up, and they usually would have things like, um, you know, language or sexual situation or, or things like that. Um, Dear Justice, I really do feel like is one of those books that it's, it's open really for anyone 12 and up. The subject matter is, um, can be emotionally raw, but at the same time, it's an issues book that I think kids are hearing about on the fringe and they want to know about. Um, it is the follow-up to Dear Martin, which is beautiful and um, 
is about a young man who is kind of trying to process his own pain and what he's seeing in the world by writing letters to Martin Luther King Jr. as like a catharsis piece. And that is being taught in schools and is beautifully done. And Dear Justice is a follow-up and it follows up a young man as he's reflecting on his life and trying to figure out how he got where he is today while he sits in jail and thinking about his life choices and, um, and what kind of led up to this situation. So it's a book that has a lot to talk about, um, but Nick Stone has a huge readership. And I think that this is a fantastic one, especially if you have fans of like, The Hate You Give, you should be reading Dear Martin and Dear Justice. Okay, go to the next one, please, Daryl. And I know a lot of people have been looking for books to help younger people talk about race, relations, um, you know, justice, right? And what is going on in the world and how we talk about it and how we can put words to these feelings and uncertainty. And I know a lot of adults have read things like, you know, how to be an anti-racist, right? And books like White Fragility. And the talk is one of those books that can, um, you know, help facilitate those conversations. You know, it's a collection of short stories and essays and poems, um, but it really invites families um, to be able to talk about anti-racism and how to be a change agent. And that came out in August. Okay, the next one, please. We're wrapping up our YA shoot. So the color is beautiful. I remember when they launched this to me, I was just like, oh, it's so good. Um, it's written by um, one of the founders of the Woman's March. It's an interesting book because it's like Hunger Games, right, meets 1984. So the idea is that is, is Amanda's like perks up and she's like, I yep. love 1984. <laughs> <laughs> you got me, you got me. <laughs> but it's a dystopian YA and uh, it's a world where it's a future United States, a near future United States and borders have been closed and uh, deportation forces run the streets and everyone is chipped. Um, every U.S. citizen is chipped, and that's how you get everything. That's how you're identified. And so, people that are illegal immigrants have fake chips, right? And so, they're trying to live under the radar. There's a black market dealing with them, and then if you're discovered, they like basically hunt you down, kind of like the, a most dangerous game. And so, you have this group of young teenagers that are trying to like escape this system once they're found out by like the big brother. So it's very action packed, um, really quickly paced, but at the same time, it deals with a lot of issues that kids are like talking about today. So it's a really, really fascinating take on it with being like something that's so contemporary and so now, but looking at it in like this dystopian perspective. So. For our book lovers who love to listen to books also, are any of these in audio that you know of? Is this one in particular? Sanctuary, I yes. believe is available in audio. Okay. Yes, before the after the Jacqueline Woodson is available on audio. Does she um, read it? No, I'm sorry. If you don't know, you don't, don't have to answer. No, but... I don't know, Daryl. Jack, I love when Jackie does read things. I, I do too. Her voice is so good. Yes. It's like every time there's a Neil Gaiman book, and I'm just like, he better be the narrator. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be I so feel... disappointed if it wasn't. <laughs> Unless it's like a multicast. That I, that I could do, but yeah, for sure. But Sanctuary is really good. Sanctuary is one I think that would be fantastic for book clubs too, whether or not that you are um, young adult or are you much older just because there's so much to talk about, you know? And um, sometimes I find myself where I'm just like, oh, I don't know if I'm emotionally ready to like read these books. Mm -hmm. And then I start and I just can't stop. And I will say that this is an emotional roller coaster. Um, your heart will pound, you will need tissues. Um, <laughs> but it is, um, it is so beautifully done. So highly recommend that. And then I, um, all the YA books are available as eBooks. All the children's books are available as eBooks okay. essentially. Yeah, so you can get them for that. It's always interesting too when the picture books are available for eBooks because <laughs> I don't know, I feel like maybe on the iPad it's okay my boys um, are not big digital readers which so whatever I tried they're like no mom we need the paper um, but yes the majority of titles are available for ebooks so it makes it easy and I think some of them are even up on the library uh, app right are we just do we participate in Libby Daryl 
Yes, most books are available that we'll find that we're talking about tonight are going to be available through the library catalog, either okay. in print and audio format, the physical versions, and many of them will be available on our Overdrive or Libby app um, in either an ebook or e audio. We also have our Hoopla um, uh, product, which has uh, digital content also. So you may be able to find it in between one of those, one of those options. Okay, awesome. Um, but if you're listening to 13s on audio, you might scare yourself. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a sky beyond the storm. So this is book four and the conclusion of one of my favorite fantasy series of all times, An Ember in the Ashes by Saba Tahir. There are four books in this series, um, Ember in the Ashes, A Torch Against the Night, A Reaper at the Gates, and now The Sky Beyond a Storm. And they follow this world where um, the masks, this like hard militaristic dictatorship society that has like silver masks formed into their skin um, control and dominate every civilization on this planet and they've almost like they've totally subjugated the scholar class they start training masses children put them in military academies where they have to like brutishly try to prove their worth um, and the book starts off with a young scholar girl who goes undercover in the Briar Cliff um, like Academy, which trains the mass to try to uncover what's going on because her brother was a rebel and was kidnapped and she wants to rescue him. Well, four books later, we have had a revolution. <laughs> we have had um, Jin um, appear from the desert. We've had people become guardians of the dead. Like it is never stopping. I think Saba just purposely likes to um, set you off your pace and make you cry. Um, it's a book that I like frantically checked our Dropbox every day to see if we had a manuscript posted so I could put it in. Um, it has adult and kid fans alike. It is beautiful and I cannot wait until book four um, hits the docket on December 1st, even though we'll be sad that it's over. And I'm not gonna tell you, but there's just so many people don't make it. Um. <laughs> But at least there's time to catch up on the first three books until December there's 1st. There's so right? much time to catch up. The nice thing is, is that all three of the previous books are available in paperback now. Reaper at the Gates just came out in paperback on September 1st. It is a great series to binge read, especially with book four coming. Um, and really great action adventure and brilliant fight scenes. You know, I feel like that's such an art, um, is writing a good fight scene. And so Saba does a fantastic job. And then finishing up, the children's books um, is actually a title that we have so much adult interest in. So, um, see, so um, the Book of Dust uh, was kind of like the first prequel, uh, I guess, to or prequel companion series to the His Dark Materials. Um, and then book two came out last year. And now we have the third book. Um, so if you loved, um, you know, The Golden Compass and all of those books, um, I really think you should check the Book of Dust trilogy. It follows um, Lyra and her demon um, outside of the series. So these gift editions that they've been doing are absolutely stunning. They have illustrations throughout that look like woodcuts. So must have for fantasy fans. And I haven't read this one yet, so I can't tell you guys all the things about it, but oh. I love this series though. It's so good. It's so good. All right. And now it's over um, to okay. the big kids so turn. Then... Okay. Yeah. Now it's <laughs> the time big for the big kids turn. Yes. Although I'm always, I'm always a little jealous of Judy because her books are so much fun and they're so exciting. <laughs> they are really um, fun. But I think if we were in working, we're all working from home right now. If we were in the office, I definitely would have found a, uh, an ARC of Sanctuary sitting on my desk, I think at one point. Uh, but my list, I think, is a lot of fun, and there are some really, uh, there are reads here for everyone, um, so I think everybody can find something here they like, um, starting with what is going to be our biggest book of this year, um, President Obama's memoir, A Promised Land. Um, Daryl, I know you remember the demand for Michelle Obama's book, The Becoming, yes. um, and how long the, uh, the, the wait list got for that for the library. Uh, this is definitely one people will be looking for. 
uh, early and often, I think, uh, and definitely the gift book of the holidays. Um, President Obama decided to write his memoir in two parts. So part one, A Promised Land, is going to cover um, really his childhood and how he came into politics, um, the start of his political career and the first two years of his presidency. Um, I think it's going to be fantastic. We know he's a great writer. We know folks have been dying to get their hands on this book. We're very excited. Will he be doing a book tour like his wife did the other year? <laughs> I, I guess at times hope, don't. We hope he'll get out on the road at some point. We okay. don't know what that's going to look like yet. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. Excellent. Um, and I thought for the, the Halloween season, I would share one of my ghost stories on the list. And this is probably one that, that Judy would really like. Um, but the Ghosts of Harvard is the story of a young woman who goes to Harvard the year after her brother committed suicide on the Harvard campus. Um, and she is there both to sort of process her own feelings, but also to figure out what happened to him because the, the suicide was very uh, unexpected. Uh, and as soon as she winds up there, she starts hearing voices. Uh, and there are the voices of people connected to Harvard's history. Uh, so there are a lot of layers to this. I really love the way that it blends together um, a lot of different possible explanations for what she's experiencing. They could be ghosts. She could be having her own mental illness episodes happening. There's also a physics explanation that comes in at one point. So, you know, you can sort of uh, choose your own explanation, but she ends up uncovering this mystery surrounding her brother's death that goes much deeper than she expected. Uh, and it's a, a fantastic ghost story and one I think a lot of people will enjoy for, um, for Halloween. And then the next book on my list is from Isabel Wilkerson. She was the author of The Warmth of Other Suns for which she won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and this book is such a fantastic follow-up to that one. Uh, it was an Oprah pick back in August, um, but I think it's one that we're gonna be reading and talking about for years to come. Um, she's talking about caste systems and what they look like, how they have shaped our history as a country uh, and why we sort of build these structures in our society. Um, but Isabel is a fantastic historian and manages to blend personal narratives so well with her history um, that, that you really don't even realize what you're reading until you've gotten to the end and realize you've gotten several gut punches along the way. Uh, so here she's comparing uh, the societies of India, of the United States, uh, and of Nazi Germany to see the ways these different societies have used this idea of caste and of hierarchy within society uh, to really perpetuate uh, their own strength. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating read. Um, it is going to be a next read for anybody who read uh, White Fragility and How to Be an Anti-Racist over the summer. Uh, and really one that is going to change the way we look at our country. And I'm assuming there's a lot of book club resources out there for this title. The, there are a lot. And I think okay. it's a fantastic pick for book clubs that like to read nonfiction or who like to read history. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So next on here, Transcendent Kingdom from Yaa Jesse. She is one of our repeat authors on this list that we are, are so excited to have uh, a follow-up as strong uh, and as, as beautifully written uh, as, as, as we've got. And, and I had to, to bring her up because her writing is so stellar. It is so intricate and raw and moving um, that it's a book that just takes your breath away. And another one I really love for, for book clubs. Uh, this is the story of Gifty, who's a Ghanaian immigrant to the United States uh, and a PhD student studying neuroscience. Uh, and the irony of her position is that she's studying depression and addiction at the same time that her brother back in Alabama um, is succumbing to his own addictions and, and her mother falls into a very deep depression uh, and won't leave her bed. Uh, so she's wrestling with science and with faith, with love of her family, with her religion. Uh, There's so many different layers to this novel uh, and introducing into all of that, 
the complexity of being an immigrant family in America. Uh, it's really just a knockout read. All right, another fan favorite, um, Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Uh, Naomi, we know really well from the fantasy world. Uh, this is the book that I think is really gonna bring her to a much more mainstream audience. Um, but you might know her from Uprooted or Spinning Silver where she puts a twist on uh, familiar fairy tales. A Deadly Education is the book for your uh, grown up or much more mature YA readers who love Harry Potter and kind of want to go back to a much darker magical school. Uh, the school of Mance, the, the school in this world, <laughs> is so infested with magic that it is actively trying to kill the students at all times. Uh, it is a book, a school without teachers, and to graduate, you basically have to survive the school. Um, it's dark. There are a lot of really intricate social structures that happen and develop in this school that, again, has no teachers, no adults, just magic. Um, but this is a book that has maybe the best cliffhanger ending I've read in a very long time. And the audio book is really good. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and That's it says great to know. Lesson one, do we know how many? It's a planned series of so many. I believe it's going to be a series of three. We should okay. see books two and three coming fairly quickly. So hopefully there won't be a long drawn out wait for these. Okay, great. And we had a question on the last book uh, sure. for Transcending Kingdom. Would it be appropriate for high school ages? I, th I think it's appropriate for your mature YA readers, not so much because there was um, language or sexual content as Judy thinks about with the, uh, the her YA, uh, but because there's a, a you know some drug use in this, there are a lot of, of really deep issues to be unpacked. Uh, but I think if you've got uh, mature readers who really get drawn into stories, this is a great choice for them. Okay, great, thank you. I wanted to catch that before we moved on too far. Yeah. All right, going in a very different direction, but one that I love. Uh, everybody loves a good romance these days, and I am just a sucker for a trade paperback romance. This is the one that just kind of, I was, it was such an indulgent kind of guilty pleasure to read this book. Uh, I think anybody would enjoy it. Uh, but it's the story of four brothers who inherit a mitt shop from their mother in Harlem. Uh, and Jesse, who is both the family heartbreaker and the family screw up, is the only one who's kind of invested in keeping the shop going. Uh, fortunately for him, uh, the, the part-time staffer at the shop, Carrie, uh, has always had a little bit of a crush on Jesse, uh, is, is willing to, to put in some hard work and maybe work a few late nights uh, to keep the shop going. Um, so this, for anybody who loves a really indulgent, lovely romance with a happy ending, this is going to be the book, book for you. Uh, and it's got guys knitting in it. So, I mean, it's, it's just a winner all around. All right. The Vanishing Half, another one that uh, is a, a second novel from an author that we loved their first novel uh, and just delighted to have something uh, are really stunning as they follow up. Uh, the Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which incidentally is my favorite cover on this list. I think it's absolutely stunning. Um, but it's the story of two twins who are identical, but their lives are really sort of mirror images of each other. They're, they're almost complete opposites. Um, they both flee the family home in this, this small rural town that they grew up in um, in the 1950s when they're 16 uh, and go to Washington DC to, to kind of start a new life. But their lives become very different very quickly. Uh, one sister ends up coming back with her daughter to live at this town, in this town, um, which is a, a predominantly African-American community. Uh, and the other sister marries a white man and raises a daughter passing as white uh, in Washington DC. And their lives don't really come back together for another 40 years. Uh, and all of these decisions that they've made, the way that their, their lives diverged from each other, uh, kind of bring them back together and get tangled up in very surprising ways. Uh, but I love Britt Bennett. She is a, a lyrical writer. 
Um, she will tug at my heartstrings faster than just about anybody out there. Uh, but this is a book that I love to recommend from an author that isn't on the radar for a lot of folks yet. All right. Now, the next one is an author that is on the radar, and I'm kind of contractually obligated to mention her because she is my sister's very favorite author of all time, uh, Jodi Picoult. Uh, and Jody writes a lot of books that are kind of really of the moment and responding to, um, you know, big headline grabby news stories. Uh, this book's a little bit different. It's the, the story of a woman named Dawn who's an Egyptologist, or she was an Egyptologist, or she could be an Egyptologist. And what I mean about that by that is that there's a sort of sliding doors-esque note to this book. Um, the very first page is Dawn is on an airplane uh, that is getting ready to crash. And the first person she thinks of is not her husband uh, or her daughter, but the man who broke her heart years before. And once that plane kind of lands on the ground, everybody's fine. She does go to the hospital with a concussion, uh, but you begin to get two separate storylines. Uh, of a dawn that goes back to her husband and her job as a quote death doula where she helps people who are, have a terminal illness uh, kind of transition through the, the end stages of their lives um, or a dawn that goes back to Egypt to reconnect with her, her lost love uh, and the title the book of two ways actually comes from an Egyptian book about the afterlife um, and the different options that are presented to, to souls as they transition. Um, I think it is, it's definitely a page turner. It is a book that you will finish a chapter and kind of look at the clock on the nightstand and think, okay, sure, I can get one or two or three more in <laughs> tonight. Because, you know, we're, we're all working remotely from and now. We can work in our pajamas if we need to, right? All right, the next one here, a true story, true story uh, which is a novel, not a true story. Uh, but I bring this up because Kate Reed Petty is a local author from Baltimore. And this is a story set here in Maryland, but one that is um, kind of compelling and psychological and feels like it's ripped from the headlines, uh, even though it's not. Um, so 15 years after a out of control high school party, um, and a really toxic rumor that started to spread out of this high school party. Uh, the four people sort of at the center of the story are still trying to deal with the fallout of it in their lives. And the main character here, Alice, is a woman who is, her entire life is really dominated by this one night, but she doesn't have any memory of it at all. Um, at this point in the story, she's a ghost writer and, and gets the opportunity to write the story of one of the other people, sort of unawares. And she figures this is going to be her chance to um, go back to figure out what happened and kind of get some closure in her life. Uh, but we know that things are never that clean and easy. Uh, it's, it digs a lot of, of fresh wounds uh, into all of these characters uh, and raises a lot more questions than answers. Uh, but a book that I think um, is great for book clubs. It's one that there are so many different talking points and entry points to it. You can talk about it for days. Is there many Maryland landmarks references that we just add not, that little not extra? Not so many landmarks, but I, I do think that you will find yourself as you read it, um, wondering if it sounds a little bit too familiar and a little bit too close to home, if you know okay. what I mean. Um, I ha certainly have some guesses about where this particular high school might have been. <laughs> okay. All right, the next one I've got, uh, I'll back to nonfiction here, is Action Park. Uh, and if you know anybody who lived in or around New Jersey in the 1980s, you have probably heard them tell stories about Action Park, uh, although they might have called it Accident Park or Class Action Park or Traction Park, uh, some of the, the many, many nicknames that it had. Uh, but it was a absolutely crazy place to work or spend an afternoon. Uh, and the, the author here, Andy Mulvihill, 
I always want to get that V in the wrong spot there, um, is actually the son of the owner and founder of Action Park. And the philosophy at Action Park was that um, nobody was going to tell you not to do something. You are 100% in control of the amount of fun that you want to have in this amusement park. Um, and so they had a notoriously dangerous water um, wave pool. They had water slides that did a full loop-de-loop -loop, uh, and look absolutely terrifying. Um, and the behind the scenes stories that, that come to light in this um, are every bit as, as epic and sound just as nuts uh, as you can imagine. Uh, there's also a documentary that just came out about this class action park um, for a little bit more behind the scenes. Now, I promised myself I was not going to do a Matthew McConaughey impression here. Um, so please hold me to that. I will say that you will do your, <laughs> exactly, right? It almost comes out without you controlling it. <laughs> Uh, we're all thinking it at the exact same moment. Uh, but do yourself a favor, go, after we're done here, go to Facebook, pull up Matthew McConaughey's page and, and he, let him introduce this book himself. Um, he is a person who views life as a riddle um, that just lays out clues all along your life waiting to be solved. He calls this his love letter to life. Uh, and it's his guide to catching more green lights in your life. Uh, his whole attitude is that uh, once you realize that all the, the red lights and the yellow lights that are slowing you down will turn into green lights eventually, you can just like relax and let your life take you where it's going to take you. Um, and it, you know what, in 2020, I think that is such a great <laughs> message and philosophy for us all to have. Um, definitely somebody you're, you find yourself thinking, do I need a Matthew McConaughey? memoir in my life but then you're so glad you get to spend two or three hours inside of his head um, because you know it's just a fascinating place to be <laughs> all right and my fav personal favorite author on this list is tana french she is um, an author that i am always kind of sneaking in and looking in the, the bookstore or in the library just in case a new book from her has appeared uh, and I didn't know about it uh, and what a delight that would be. This one, it just came out. So if you're one of those people, the next time you go to the library, you're gonna see it there. Um, Tana French is The Searcher. Uh, this is another standalone book. So it's not part of the, the Dublin murder series. Um, but it is a book set in the western part of Ireland with a retired American uh, police detective who is kind of looking to escape his life. He's looking to escape that world uh, of the, the detective that, that kind of ruined his, his marriage and, and who wants us to start over and start fresh. Um, and a, a mystery comes knocking on his door in the the middle of the night in the form of a, uh, a, a child that nobody seems to, to know exists except for him. And I won't go too much further into the, the plot than that, uh, other than to say she is such a fantastic writer and fully evokes that whole um, kind of windblown, solitary, isolated world of Western Ireland, um, that it's the perfect book to read, maybe on a windy, chilly night and late fall, um, but with something to keep you warm, a nice big blanket. Awesome. Is this available in audio too, do you know? It is, and I've always awesome. loved her audio books. Okay, same narrator. Mm -hmm. yes. A very good narrator. I um, She's an author that I will read the book and then get the audio and do the audio yes. so I can experience it both ways. Great. All right, Agent Sonia for our history readers going into the holidays here. Um, now, if you were living in a small Cotswolds village in England in the 1940s and you saw a woman riding down the street on her bike, um, it might not raise too many eyebrows. Uh, even if you knew her as somebody local, somebody friendly, but pretty reserved, um, somebody who is 
unassuming in every possible way, you'd probably be surprised to find out that she was one of the most successful and notorious Soviet spies in operation in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Uh, but this was actually uh, a woman named Ursula who um, went by the code name Agent Sonia. Um, she was hunted by, at different points, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Nazis, MI5, the CIA, uh, eventually even the, the Soviet intelligence uh, was looking at her as they went through purge after purge after purge. Uh, but she was the woman who sold most of Britain's secrets, atomic secrets, to the Soviet Union. Um, and almost um, completely unsuspected by anyone in her life. Um, it's a very little known story. Uh, if you like to read historical fictions of World War II, this is a great chance to read something uh, from a master of, of world, world War history um, and somebody who um, is, is a really compelling character. Uh, anybody who read A Woman of No Importance uh, which is about local, um, a local spy from here in Maryland from near Virginia Hall. This is a, a great follow-up to that read. All right, now something completely different from Dr. Deepak Chopra, um, Total Meditation. Now, Chopra, as I was, was looking into and learning about this book, has written over 90 different books on different aspects of spirituality and meditation. Uh, this is sort of the one-stop shop masterclass for people who are interested in meditation uh, because it goes into all of the different ways that it impacts us spiritually, physically, uh, what kinds of transformations it offers to practitioners. Uh, but it also goes into his personal philosophy of what meditation is, why it's important, and what it has to offer us. Um, so I think this is a book for anybody who's interested. Um, great for beginners, as well as advanced practitioners, um, and includes a kind of 52-week uh, year-long practice of meditation uh, for people who, who want to explore it on a deeper level. Um, it's going to be a beautiful gift book. I love this for the holidays or, you know, anybody who's just looking to, to start a new habit in the new year. All right, the next slide. My last big biography on the list is from Megan Rapino, uh, the star of the U.S. women's national um, soccer team, the, the World Cup champion. Uh, and Megan is one of the world's top athletes uh, on the soccer fields, but she's also an icon off of the, the soccer fields. And what I loved about this book is the way Megan goes back to her childhood and she was really raised with dual purposes. She was obsessed with soccer and with competing on the athletic level, but she was also raised to be invested in her community. Uh, from a very young age, uh, her parents had her and her brothers and sisters volunteering in different community organizations. And that's something that she's carried all the way forward in her life today. Um, she has never wavered from that. She's still very invested. Um, I think for this is one of my favorite gift ideas for the holidays. Um, she is such a, a fantastic, compelling person. Uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic read. And my last two books here are two big follow-ups um, that we've been waiting a long time for, uh, and they absolutely will not disappoint uh, the established fans. So first up, John Grisham. Probably his best-known book is A Time to Kill. You might remember Matthew McConaughey from that movie as well. <laughs> that was my introduction to John Grisham. Uh, he's going back to Jake Brigantz in A Time for Mercy. Uh, and once again, Brigantz is drawn into a case that is dividing his community. This time, a 16-year-old boy is on, um, is on trial for the death of or suspected murder of a police deputy. Uh, and the, um, it's going to be a capital case. He's facing the death penalty. Um, 
saving this young man from the, the gas chamber is going to mean putting absolutely everything on the line for Jake Brigant, Jake Brigantz, uh, which is just what we expect from John Grisham. This one's gonna be an absolute page turner. And my last one, the book that I have been waiting for for years, the book that I probably get asked for more often than anything else, uh, Ready Player Two, the follow-up to Ready Player One. Um, now, Ready Player One is a favorite book of mine. It is my favorite book to recommend to people um, because everyone loves it, reads it, and loves it, uh, and wants to talk about it. Um, so you might remember Ready Player One, quick synopsis. Um, Wade Watts lives in a world dominated by what we would recognize as, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, Al alternate reality computer uh, games and things like that. And there's an Easter egg hunt for control of the whole thing. Without giving too much away in Ready Player Two, we are right back in that world where Wade has discovered that there is a, a secret at the heart of the Oasis uh, that will make it even more exciting and awesome and enticing, but also much more addicting. Uh, and this time there are uh, millions of lives at stake, literal lives in the pages of this book. Um, once again, there is a riddle that has to be uncovered. There's another Easter egg hunt. So we can expect all of the, the wonderful uh, 80s and pop culture and video game references that we all loved so much in Ready Player One. I'm dying to read this. Uh, I understand Will Wheaton is doing the audio for this one, which again, highly, highly recommend the audio on it. Um, this is the book that I will, uh, if it's not under my Christmas tree, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> my one question was going to be, was Will Wheaton reading this uh, follow-up, the sequel to it? Because it's probably the best audio book I've listened to. And I just listened to it you not too long. I don't think that's a too crazy to say. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the best in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was that good. So I've been very excited to see this. And my question I was going to ask was about Will Wheaton. So thank you for answering it for me. No problem. And, you know, it's such a Ready Player One is such a wonderful book. We're back when in um, April when, you know, the world was feeling kind of crazy and we were locked down and canceling our in-person uh, book buzz. That was the book I turned to for a little bit of, of kind of comfort reading, the, the old familiar friend. Um, and I, I know that this is gonna deliver all those same feelings for me. Excellent. And I believe, did you say that was your last book, Miss Amanda? That's the last one, yeah. That's what I thought. I'll leave that screen up there so we can look at that one. And I will say about Ready Player One also, it's not too often that people can outdo Steven Spielberg but the book was so incredible. The movie was good. The book the was, was so fun. incredible. Yes. The book was amazing. They're just two different experiences. Now, I'm not sure if we've been answering all the questions in chat as we go along. Yes, we have answered all the questions. Yes, on live and also mm -hmm. in chat. I think everyone's been writing their list down frantically like I have. <laughs> Great. I also have a handout if I can figure out how to get it to everybody. They all, whenever our friends from Penguin Random Mouse come out to our branch, they always send us this nice little handout, one side with the kids in YA and one side with the big kid adult titles on there also. So they've already gotten me that, that um, I can figure out how to get out to everybody also. We can always email a PDF out. Yes, that's how I have it right now. So it's a PDF. <laughs> So if there, were there any other questions? I don't, oh. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Karen. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Amanda, for taking time out to share. We all have a love of books, but uh, I do appreciate you taking your time out to share tonight some of the ones. Is there one that didn't make tonight's presentation that you're really excited about that you want to give us a quick look into? Oh, there's so many. Um, I'll give you a, a peek way down the road to next spring. There's a book called What Came After by Joanne Tompkins. 
Well, okay. Um, well, whenever I ask you guys this question, you give me great little nuggets because you gave me that, uh, Daisy that Jones. That is the one the I will be keeping an eye on. <laughs> okay. What was that again? I'm writing it down now. It's called What Came After by what Joanne came? Tompkins. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And then um, save the date for, I'm just going to find the month that it's coming out. Um, but David Arnold, who is a YA author that I have presented to Book Buzz several times, um, he wrote a great um, uh, Kids of Appetite, Strange Fascinations, Noah Hypnotic. Um, but he's got a fantastic book called Electric Kingdom that will be coming out in February. And it is like um, Station Eleven meets the fifth wave. Ooh. Ooh. So it transcends, I really feel like the young adult audience, any reader will enjoy this book. It takes, um, it jumps back and forth in time, has multiple perspectives, but it's about this um, carnivorous fly pandemic that has totally rocked the world and has left a, a band of survivors and one girl has set out to get to a certain location on a specific day and time as was instructed by her scientist father and she meets people along the way and there is a shadowy figure that seems to be moving the pieces to make sure she gets to her journey but she's not sure who it is. It's one of those books that like got me out of the reading slump because I love to read, but 2020 has been difficult <laughs> to concentrate <laughs> and I devoured this thing. So I um, highly recommend it's called Electric Kingdom, David Arnold. It's coming yes. in February. Great. I've got them both on my radar already. All right. Well, I don't think there's any other questions or anything coming in. So it is time for us to say good night and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amber, for helping us steer. And we will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>